，上帝。Okay, thank you very much.、Um, Julian, can we just dim the side lights, please,、um, if you can hear me? So, thanks very much for coming to our、uh, fourth Origins conference.、Uh, we've been doing this for a good few years now. Obviously, this came from the Questing Conference, combined with the conference I'm organising called Megalithomania, which we do in Glastonbury every May.、Um, obviously, I'm 100% obsessed by megaliths, but I've also realised that I am Olmec as well, because.、Um, This is a T-shirt and a hashtag that you should use a lot if you do anything Olmec.、Uh, a lot of people say I look like an Olmec,、um, which is which is I, I take as a compliment nowadays.、Um, I didn't before, but I do now, so it's all okay. So the Olmec are a really interesting culture. I've been to Mexico three or four times, spent a total of about eight months there exploring、uh, the different. Uh, cultures there, but the one that really grabbed my attention from ver the very early times, back in 2003 even, was this culture. And the, these were a culture that were there before the Maya, long before the Maya.、And、they go back at least to 1800 BC, although there's evidence that goes back even further、uh, in Guatemala. Now, not many people have even. I mean, to, to be, anyone here not heard of the Olmec at all? You got absolutely no. Oh, you're all really wised up. Very good. Very good. All of you. But、um, here's just some of the things、uh, we're going to get through、uh, today. There's some really early evidence, which is kind of like anomalous, which we're going to have a look at briefly. The origins of the Olmecs, about where they could have come from,、uh, and we have to sort of look at them as the first temple builders in Mexico and that part of the world now. And it certainly wasn't the Mayans, and even. The, the the famous Mayan calendar, the long count, the Zolkin, and all the other counts that they used were developed and originated by the Olmec and not by the Maya. There's very interesting artifacts with some interesting clues. There's some Epi Olmec script that looks like it comes from other countries around the world. But the the main theory is that they're either African or Chinese or potentially even Polynesian. They don't look native, Native American or Native Mexican, really. That is the one thing about this culture that has caused a lot of controversy. It's also linked with that is the mystery of Quetzalcoatl or the plumed serpent, who was one of the great gods of ancient Mexico.、And、he goes way back, even to the time of the Olmec. There's also elongated skulls and cranial deformation throughout Mexico and many different cultures. And even giant skeletons, which, if we have time, we'll have a look at a few examples. But they were probably later than the Olmec. So this is the area we're going to look at here.、Uh, so it's this area here around. Oh, oops, a daisy. Uh, uh, so it's this area around here, around the Gulf Coast.、Uh, obviously, we've got North America up there.、And、this is the Yucatan, the famous Mayan area, and obviously Gu Guatemala and Belize. But this area here is really where it's all happening when you're looking at the Olmec culture.、Uh, La Venta, San Lorenzo, and Tres Zapotes are the three main sites. But there's evidence that they spread out around Mexico City to a site called Chalcatzingo and a few others, and also down into southern Guatemala.、Uh, oh God! And also、uh, into Honduras, and even possibly down to Costa Rica, where the stone spheres have been、um, uh, noted. Here is just some of the. These are all the official Olmec heads. There's 17 of these that have been discovered throughout the Olmec world.、Uh, two at Tres Zapotes, three at Levanta, ten at San Lorenzo, one at La Cabota, and there's, a, there's another one which has come from a sort of obscure place. The earliest dating is 1800 BC, but it really peaked around 1200 BC、uh, in this part of Mexico at Levanta. And they came from the Los Tuxlas Mountains, and they're at least 60 miles away. And some of these heads are 40 tons. The heaviest one is 40 tons.、Uh, they range from about 18 tons to about 40 tons, and they're very hard type of volcanic basalt. Most of them, they vary in rock style、uh, sometimes, but they're various different forms of basalt.、And、the interesting thing about them as well, which kind of grabs me, is that some of them were used as another monument and then carved into. An Olmec head, which we'll look at more detail about that later. And there's even examples that, of Olmec heads、um, at a place called Cholula、uh, near Puebla, near Mexico City, and even all the way down in、um, Guata southern Guatemala, but probably of a slightly later date. This is the strange head. This was、uh, recorded back in the 1930s, and this has caused a huge amount of controversy because apparently it's been destroyed. It's no longer you can no longer witness this. 
Um, but they think now it might have been a relatively modern carving. But you've probably seen images of this. David Hatcher Childress and other researchers have uh, had this on their, um, in their books and on their websites. So this is just one other strange head, but we're going to look at some other ones that are uh, probably later Olmec or influenced by the Olmec in different parts of the country. Again, so we're going to start really just um, around, oh God, it keeps doing that, oops a daisy. So we're going to start again around this area, around um, Tres Zapotes up here. Uh, this, this isn't the oldest site. The oldest site really is San Lorenzo, but the first real discoveries and excavations took place near or around Tres Zapotes. The first Olmec cave was discovered in 1862, uh, and it was kind of ignored, it was recorded, it was, people knew about it, but everyone thought it was just some Mayan carving and, and left it at that. It wasn't until 1905 that German archaeologists archaeologist Edward Seller noted it again and recorded the same head discovered at Tres Zapotes. Um, and, um, and this is when the kind of name Olmec really started being used because there was an old Aztec term which kind of translates as people uh, of, the, of the rubber because they created uh, and produced rubber in that area along the Gulf Coast from the trees there. Um, and even in the highlands around Mexico City there was talk of a lost culture uh, and there was, that was often linked with Quetzalcoatl and this strange race of people who used to rule different parts of Central America. Um, so again, here are some of the people involved in the um, discoveries. Uh, Jose Melgar in 1862, he was the guy who first noted it. And he was astonished, and he, I, I quote, was astonished of the Ethiopic type represented. I reflected that there had undoubtedly been Negroes in this country, and this has been the first epoch of the world. So the first person to see the first Olmec head immediately referred to them as not looking like they're from you know, native Central America. And then in 1925, uh, Franz Blom and Oliver Lefarge uh, discovered Laventa and some other sites in the area, and they believed it was just an outpost of the Maya. In 1927, um, they were, Herman Bayer was a, an anthropologist, and he believed the Olmec of the Totonac civilization. And this is where they really got stuck with the name Olmec, and it's kind of unfortunate. It's like the way that the Druids got linked with Stonehenge, this name Olmec got stuck with this culture, although no one really knows who they were called, even though we have one idea which I'll share with you a little bit later. Um, Marshall Saville, he was the head of the American Museum of the American Indian in New York in 1929. And it was again, the name was again used by George C. Valiant uh, in the late 1920s, because he did explorations in the area. And again, that name got used once more. So these are just some of the people involved here. This is George Valiant here, he's a rather dashing fellow. And Tres Apotes, and this is one site I've been to twice. I've had a, had a good look around it. The last time we went there, we managed to actually go to the site itself, which is now a series of mounds uh, a couple of miles south of the small town. Now, you have to, it takes a, you know, you've really got to know what you're doing to get to places in the Olmec world, because it's often raining, and there's often mud everywhere, and swamps, and things like this. So you've got to take the right roads at the right time of year, or you'll get stuck quite easily. This is uh, Matthew Sterling, um, who died in 1975. He was a he one of the head archaeologists at the Smithsonian. Not only was he involved in actual some giant reports, um, which uh, we feature in our book, but he was the man who really popularised and, and uncovered much of the Olmec world we see today. Even back in 1918, he had suspicions that there was some culture there. He'd seen various photos from Tres Zapotes, and artifacts and this strange script that came from the, the Gulf Coast area. And on, literally on his first two days <coughs> of excavating at Tres Zapotes in 1939, he uncovered this. Now this is uh, what's called Stella C. And this is actually him investigating it when it was still buried in the ground. And this is really interesting because this actually has some Mayan glyphs that represent the, uh, the calendar, the long count calendar. And they eventually, when they found the top part, they eventually realized it dated to 31 BC. Now it's not that old, it's a very, very latest part of the Olmec. This is when they were probably dying out completely. But it, it is relevant because it's much earlier than any Maya calendar. 
Uh, it was carved from basalt, and on the other side we have this um, strange looking figure, which is some kind of weird jaguar face here, which is a motif they use throughout the Olmec world. And also this guy looks like sort of He-Man thing uh, going on his chest here. Quite excited look on his face. Um, but this is the, the oldest Mesoamerican long count calendar unearthed at the time. Um, and they, they think it was September the 3rd, 31 BC or 32 BC, they're not too sure because it all depends on a couple of factors. This is a close up of what it looks like. This is actually in the um, Mexico National Museum now. Oops. And this is what it looks like in the museum now. And it wasn't until 1969, I mean, they contended it was 31 BC back in 1939, but it wasn't until 1969 they actually found the second part and actually confirmed that date, and, uh, and they were correct in their assumptions leading up to that. And this is just a very important aspect because this, 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 this discovery suddenly rewrote the history of the Americas completely because the Olmecs weren't known about. They'd been rumoured about, but they were not known about. And all the Mayanists, all the academics were very upset because they dedicated their careers to the Maya being the mother civilization. But other calendar systems had been, or numbers had been carved on other sites. Um, this is a place called Chapa de Corzo, and um, uh, several years later, this one was discovered, and it was 36 BC is the, is the date they found it. I'm not going to get into all the numbers here. I did a whole um, load of research with the brilliant um, Jeff Stray, who's really looked into the calendars and number systems of the ancient uh, Maya. And, uh, but we found other, other evidence as well that could date these even older, but we're not going to get into that right now. And this is just when they first discovered it, they were all rather happy. Um, um, and this, and what they did, they did some dating at Tresopotas and they got a date of around 1000 BC. Um, and this was like after San Lorenzo was in decline. Uh, and, and Tresopotes kind of rose up around that time and Leventa rose up around that time as well. Uh, but the dating is uh, not being fully investigated and there could be much earlier dates because they really haven't dug that much of the Olmec world even today. This is actually in 1939. This photo was taken on my birthday. I wasn't alive in 1939, but on my birthday in 1939. And this is Matthew Sterling and his team actually uh, just hanging out at Tresopotes, obviously having a tea break. This is what it looks like now. Uh, this is the sign outside, and they've got big murals and things like this. And you don't actually go to the site officially. You only go to the little site museum uh, and where some of the artifacts are on display. But we persuaded, uh, sort of harassed really, the museum curator and gave him some cash uh, to take us to the actual mounds and pyramids that uh, you can go and see. And no one goes there. And we went there, uh, we got photos. Next time, I'm going back there in December, I'm going to take my drone and get some aerial shots of it. Um, this is a very interesting piece. I'm just going to show you lots and lots of uh, stone artifacts. This is a massive basalt piece of rock. It's probably about five foot wide. Very strange. And you, you tap it, it's got acoustic qualities. And it looks like these bits here, oh, crikey, oops a daisy. These bits here on the end, uh, they're kind of, it's almost like they're knocked together to create like a bell sound. How they did this, how they even carved this and brought it 60 kilometers from the Tuxla Mountains is a mystery. This is, one, this is one of the Olmec heads. This is the first one that was discovered there that we saw images of. It's on display actually at Tres Zapotes. The other one is on display at a nearby town, Santiago Tuxla. This is a map of the site. Um, you can't really see too, you can't really work out what's going on there really. Um, but here's a better image of it. This just shows you a kind of aerial shot borrowed from uh, credit to Ken Garrett who took this shot. And there's us exploring it. We were highly excited being, you know, considering I am Olmec and, uh, and all the megalithomaniacs. And I was there with Brian Forrester and, and uh, 15 other people. And, uh, and I, you know, we didn't even know you could allow to get into the site, but we got permission and we did it. And it's just some photos of some of the mounds. There's not too much to look at, uh, but we were discovering bits of pottery uh, and other such things in the ground as we walked around, because it has not been fully excavated. Here's one of the more elongated structures. Um, which is um, just one part of the site. Here's who lives there now, uh, these guys. They kind of protect the site. Uh, and again, you can see the sort of step pyramid shape. And they really were the first people, apparently, in the Central America to build these kind of structures. Even though there is, there is in North America, we have the mound culture sites of Poverty Point and uh, Watson Break and other such places in the southern part, just on the other side of the Gulf Coast, which do date much earlier. But they are strangely a very familiar, very similar design. We found this while we were there. 
Uh, this is just um, a, a part of a pot probably. But I found this interesting because it's very similar to what we saw in the museum uh, at Santiago Tuxla, which is the nearby town. Also at the nearby town, uh, this head, this is the small museum, uh, which is on the way to Tres Zapotes really. This is the 40 ton, this is the biggest head, this is the latest one, probably dates to around 400 BC. Um, and it's huge, it's got his eyes are closed, it's a slightly different design, he does not look really that happy. Um, and this shows you the size of it here. But also in this museum, this wasn't found at Tres Zapotes, this was a place uh, called La Cabota, which is like up on the mountains where some of the stone came from. So they think this was carved and it wasn't moved back into place um, and never actually ended up at Tres Zapotes or whatever site it was destined for. And here we have these unusual chaps, look at these. Um, very uh, almost like West African looking features, almost like with an Afro haircut as well, which has been uh, commented on by various researchers, including the brilliant Ivan van Sertima um, and other people. And again, we can see that here. And this has caused a lot of controversy, this. This is huge controversy in Central America because it does suggest that uh, it was not entirely built by native people. There was a, a sort of cosmopolitan culture. And we'll see it wasn't only potentially Africans, it was also the Chinese and even Europeans or people from the Middle East. It gets crazy when you get into it. This is another angle on the, the largest Olmec head. It was kind of unfinished, but it, it looks pretty good to me. Uh, but the strange thing is the eyes are close. This was really, this could represent the end of the Olmec era. This is what some people say. It was actually the end of the era, and this is why they represent it as closing down that culture and you know integrating into the Maya. This one was found at Tres Zapotes, although it's on display at Santiago Tuxla, and it's got, even got a picture of the mounds in the background. Uh, and it has these seven braids on the back, um, which is one of the strongest arguments for African origins, because this is uh, one of the traditions that's found in Ethiopia, for instance, and in par other parts of West Africa. Uh, this braided hair with seven of them, which is like a symbolic number for them. So this is what Ivan van Sertima kind of really sort of jumped on when he realised you have obvious things like this. And this, I just want to show you this. This is the, uh, an illustration of the, uh, the Kubota hair, the huge one. I just like this. I think this dude is awesome. Whoever these people were, they were awesome. Look at them. And then we have these things, uh, we have like shells, relief carvings of shells on really hard bits of andesite and granite. It's incredible. This is just some photos I took when I was there. Uh, and this is like a kind of thing that sort of slides into the base of the temple, the base of the pyramid, with the face coming out kind of in your face like that. And this is, we find this at other places like in, in Peru uh, and different cultures, but there were certainly mounds and they were built in a certain way with certain materials. And they had these stone things around the base of them. Here's another one here. And this is really where Ivan van Sertima really did his thing. And he wrote the, the classic book, uh, They Came Before Columbus, uh, back in the mid 70s. And, um, and even in the Popol Vuh, which is a sacred book of the Quiche Maya, uh, they claim that this unusual culture, uh, an unusual culture, came on ships of bark. And it almost means that black Africans sailed across the Atlantic Ocean long before Columbus and integrated and developed and worked with the local people there. And here's just some examples comparing it to uh, Anuba chief from, from Kenya. And this is all from his book. And this is like, uh, obviously an Egyptian thing here. And this was found, uh, this actually on, was on display at the New York um, Museum. And again, it just shows you the features that he used in his case. And uh, Ivan Van Sertima, he's a, he's, a, he's a legendary gentleman really. Died in 2009, he's a Guyanese born professor of Africana studies at Rutgers University of the United States. And he really became famous when he started talking about the Olmecs. But he quoted, a study of the Olmec civilization reveals elements that so closely parallel ritual traits and techniques in the Egyptian-Nubian world of the same period that it is difficult to maintain that all these are due to mere coincidence. And this is certainly the case. We'll look at more examples later. But I just wanted to uh, get to San Lorenzo and get to some of these sites. Now, officially, the earliest dating of San Lorenzo is 1500 BC. However, there is dating up on this high plateau, which is a couple of miles from uh, uh, the river, which is, uh, comes in from the, the sea up at Coastal Cocos. 
They have got dating going to 1800 BC, which is why that's the earliest date of the Olmec, but they've got dating that also goes to about 5000 BC. So there was settlements there, but no megalithic construction going back that far. He just shows you Matthew Sterling. Again, he was the main discoverer of San Lorenzo. Uh, and he actually got a tip off from a local that upriver, when he was working at Laventa, upriver, there was this site that they found some massive megaliths at, and similar to the ones being found at Laventa and Tresapotes and others. And you can see here, this is actually what, this is how they got, they didn't have cars and ro road, no roads or anything. They had to go through swamps and rivers on horseback with mosquitoes and bugs and horrible things, snakes chasing after them. Then they had to camp there, persuade the locals to feed them and all this kind of stuff. So it was a hell of a job. Uh, and this is, quickly they found this. This is one of the first heads they found. This is Matthew Sterling, one of these guys. And this is just one of the 10 Olmec heads, colossal heads, found at San Lorenzo. While he was there, he found 15 monuments in total, and these are all on display now at Jalapa Museum. In 1964, the famous archaeologist Michael Coe continued the excavation. And this is where the 1200 BC dates, um, carbon dates, came from. The 10th head, there was nine heads discovered up until 1994, but this one was discovered then thanks to a magnetometer survey of San Lorenzo. It's found by Anne Cyphers, um, and it's a beautiful head. It's like really precision carved, and, and it somehow maintained its shape and without any chips or damage. A lot of them got deliberately damaged, and they were buried in the ground. This is how most of them were found. This one didn't get damaged somehow. All the other ones seemed to did slightly get damaged. So this is quite an interesting discovery in itself. It could have been placed and buried before the, the vandals, whoever they were at the end of the Olmec era, era um, actually did that. And it's just some interesting, uh, this is just some of the dating I was looking up uh, a couple of years ago. And you get some strange dates popping out of the San Lorenzo. Well, obviously, these could be natural things they're finding as well. But we've got, we see this number 2260 BC. So we're looking at before 1800 or 1500 BC. And these are the more standard dates we're finding all over San Lorenzo here. But this one really stood out to me. Uh, too old, perhaps some asphalt lumps present. I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but uh, this is maybe there wasn't asphalt lumps present and it could be that old indeed because at a, certain, a couple of sites in Guatemala we do find that exact date in some of the sites there. It's just some of the massive blocks we find at San Lorenzo and you can see like these little striations and sort of scoops out of this massive bit of basalt here. This is a technique we see in other cultures around the world and it's just um, a kind of um, my holiday snaps. Um, of San Lorenzo. We have sort of relief carvings. We have even have, you know, close to spheres, bird motifs. We have this kind of mutilated baby's head on the left here, this huge black volcanic piece of rock, which was actually in the middle of the San Lorenzo site. And also these strange kind of scoops and carvings uh, throughout. And we have this chap here. Um, doesn't look happy. It's not really an Olmec head, but he has got a beard, which is unusual, which could represent Quetzalcoatl, who was always depicted with a beard. And this is um, just one of the mounds. That there's nothing, you can, go to, you can go to the San Lorenzo site. Again, it's like Tresopotes. You're not supposed to go there. No one goes there. But we bribed the guy again, and we went there with our little group. And there's not much to see, but it's just interesting to sort of get into the land of where these Olmecs were living, because I am Olmec. So uh, there was water coursing throughout this site. This is one of the sort of uh, technologies that they worked with. And they had 21 man-made lakes were up on the hill where the main plateau where San Lorenzo was based. And, is, and they were lined with repellent bentonite rocks. It's water repellent rocks, so to like, keep the, the water flowing quickly. There's also 14 natural springs at the base, all around the base of San Lorenzo. And when they discovered these, um, it really kind of made the archaeologists realize this was an advanced culture. And they moved literally hundreds of tons of basalt, and they carved it into these pieces here. It's like a, just a, a flat stone on top with a shape like this underneath it. So the water would move through, and they were lined with bentonite clay. So this was a technology, and they were they were like pushing the water down, and this would create electric charge. 
Now this is just a classic thing, you know, people like John Burke and Philip Callahan and other researchers that have put this together and realised they could have been doing this to create electric charge. And then when you look at the layering of the types of clay and rock and pebbles they were using, they were all either magnetic or electrically conductive. And so they were working with these energies and there's a lot of evidence to kind of suggest that now. Um, and also the rock they used often had a high metal content which would make it electri electrically um, conductive. There's a hat there, just to show you the side. This just shows you one of the side channels uh, during the excavation. And the charge, according to John Burke, who did scientific tests at this site, he said it would gather at the top of the hill, and this is where you place all your seeds and grains, and it would guarantee that they were strong and they were abundant, and you would get higher yields and a better quality crop. And this is something that other cultures around the world have used as well. Also linked with this energy is this was discovered there. Now this is um, an iron ore magnet uh, which worked as a compass. And this is potentially the earliest one in the entire world, uh, before probably 500 to 800 years before the Chinese even invented it. We'll come on to them later because they may have been here as well. Um, they also had um, concave circular kind of mirrors made of certain types of rock, so certain types of iron ore, which they'd often wear around here. It's almost like, um, it's like reflectors. And also what they found with this particular compass is that it always, um, when you were working with it, always oriented eight degrees off north. Now this is quite interesting because this is obviously, this is taken from the ground when that was where the magnetic pole was, because it moves obviously over you know, millennia and so forth. And, but a lot of their sites are aligned eight degrees off north. So they were using these to align their sites. Uh, you know, it, and so that, that was their north. They kind of worked with that as their north. There's astronomical alignments that even match that as well, which actually Andrew goes into in his book, uh, The Cygnus Mystery. So this is, I find this quite, quite interesting, because if this is the case, and there's evidence that the Chinese came here later. They may have nicked the idea from the Olmec, taking it back to China, and they're the ones who got in the history books, um, which is a little bit annoying for them, I would imagine. But what's also interesting is that this is uh, from a place in southern Guatemala. Uh, these are like the sort of Buddha figures, but these are potentially the later Olmec, because they were migrating south looking for jade, which was their prized uh, material. It wasn't gold, it was jade. And these, on the right-hand side here, are the temples, the magnetic north orientation is actually right in their temple. And it's almost like the rock was carved around the most magnetic hotspot and placed in the temple here. And like, so they knew what was going on. They knew how to find it in the rock and they knew how to find the magnetism. And this could have been part of their kind of whole process. Um, and it could also, this could also be the same in the Olmec heads as well. Four of these heads here, which were found at a site called Monte Alto, which is now in the um, you know, central plaza of the village, uh, the town of De Democracia. I went there in 2004. Um, have, the, have this effect with them. So it's very intriguing. I find that very interesting. Uh, and there are other examples um, like this, and they're certainly not by chance. You would not have the magnetic pole in the same place in four statues by chance. And so they were working with the magnetism long, long before anyone else was. So this is some of the Olmec heads, the colossal heads from San Lorenzo. This is Monument One. This is uh, about 1200 BC. It's one of the oldest ones. This is Head Two. This is what they call it. Um, this is, again, this is in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. It's not actually in Jalapa Museum where most of them are. This one is in the Jalapa Museum. This is Monument Three. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can actually see these cut marks. This is where they were probably deliberately damaged at the end of their life. And then they were buried, because these were all on display. They were all on display at the sites originally, and then they were buried at the end. And what are some researchers are now thinking is that, in fact, they were buried because they, the, the elite people who were sort of guaranteed them good agriculture, healthy, healthy crops and things like this, had probably disappeared or migrated or died off and they were like in a desperate situation to try and kind of bring that back because they were losing all their wealth and they were a very very wealthy civilization probably because they knew how to grow food with these secret uh, techniques that they were using this is monument four again this is in Jalapa museum this one is monument five uh, we're going to keep doing this until we get to number ten it's like a countdown really isn't it uh, this is in Jalapa this one here is in um, this is in the Mexico Anthropology Museum. 
It's one of the finest ones actually. It's very, you see the beautiful carving here, it's incredible. Again, this one is in uh, the Jalapa Museum. This is in Jalapa Museum. This is number seven. And this one is the only smiling one of them all. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Makes me happy. And this is the final one that was discovered back in 1994, thanks to the Magnetometer Survey. And this is really quite beautiful, this one. But this is actually at the San Lorenzo Museum site, so you have to go there yourself. And these are all 17 Olmec heads. There you go. But there's other stonework in <coughs> San Lorenzo, which is absolutely fascinating still. We have these crouched figures with like Egyptian headdresses. Uh, we have these very unusual kind of anamorph carvings here. Oops. Uh, we have these altars, which we find in most of the Olmec sites, huge altars with like this emerging kind of shaman priest figure coming out from the earth into reality. And then we have these, this is more from San Lorenzo. Actually, I've shown you that one already. This one really intrigued me because this is uh, kind of like two kind of dwarf Olmec figures holding up the sky. We find this motif, it's like the Atlantean motif in Egypt and other places. Uh, this is from a site called Petrero Nuevo. Um, so it's a much smaller site, but still the carvings are very intricate. This is on display at Jalapa Museum as well, but I wanted to show you this because this is one of Ivan van Sertima's um, uh, comparisons here. And uh, we do find, um, let me just check what side we're going to next. So we're going to go to Leventa next, but first I wanted to show you, which is here. Uh, you can see all, all these other sites, these yellow sites are all sites. Uh, the red ones, there's nothing left of them really. But that's where the, the big old mech head, the 40 ton one came from. And this is Trisopotes. Why is it doing that? Uh, okay. Yeah, now this was found, this is a very interesting piece. This was found not actually in an Olmec site. This was found in the Tuxla Mountains near Majora or Mahora. Uh, it's nephrite jade, discovered in 1902 um, in the state of Veracruz. It has 75 glyphs of Epi Olmec or Ithsmian script, which is uh, the whole area there. It has a long count date on it again, going to 162 AD, but the, the, the type of writing on it is not at all Central American. It's very strange. It's been compared to the Shang Dynasty Chinese, which we'll look at in more detail shortly. This was also found near Leventa, a, a site called San Andreas. Um, this is one of the earliest forms of writing. Again, now this is when this was discovered in 2002. This really surpassed Tresopotes. And this has got a date uh, going back to 650 BC. Um, it also has a three Ahawa, which is a recognisable day in the Zolkin calendar. So there's suggestions that this may have been, you know, the sort of almost like the smoking gun that most certainly the Olmecs developed the calendar, because this is the date when the Olmec were in the late, later part of their time, but they were still around in this area. In the area as well, there's been some very early discoveries. They were growing maize uh, or corn back in 3100 BC. And also there's pollen evidence from 2600 BC. And they were domesticating sunflower seeds in 650 BC. So we know that they were working with agriculture and therefore probably a calendar, which is linked with agriculture way back at that time. And we know that the long count calendar, which ended on December the 21st, 2012, um, began in August uh, 3113 BC or, or 114 BC, depending on which version you look at. And so this is the time when we knew they were growing, uh, agri had agriculture in place back then. So there could, be, there could be a reason they dated it back to that time. There's a lot of speculation about that. So Leventa, this is really the kind of, uh, my favorite. This is, this is pretty amazing, this site. This is, not only is it uh, the only surviving site you can allow to visit and you have to buy a ticket and it's got an on-site museum, it's been thoroughly excavated, quite badly destroyed actually by Matthew Sterling and his team, unfortunately. Uh, and they kind of rebuilt it for the tourists. And all the, uh, all the statues here and artifacts were taken to a place in Villa Hermosa, the nearby t uh, city in Laventa Park, which you can go and visit. And they're all the original, uh, there's about 80 pieces on display there. But you can see there's a huge mound here, it's so like a seven, potentially a seven fluted sided pyramid here. We have this whole complex here with all these layers of uh, serpentine um, with 
multiple layers buried in the ground. There was, there was over a thousand tons of serpentine pieces buried in layers as well. And no one knows what this was for, but remember, serpentine is electrically conductive and has magnetic properties. It's just a, a wheeled figure that was found at Leventa, suggesting they had knowledge of the wheel back in at least 1200 BC, although they only used it for toys. Um, and obviously we have uh, these kind of features again. So this is an absolutely amazing place. It's in, it's in an island in the middle of the Tanala River. Um, and this is, um, and it's kind of raised up on a plateau with the very slow moving river either side of it. And this, this is actually part of the coastal, coastal, co co coastal Cocos River. Coastal Cocos means Serpent Sanctuary, which is quite an interesting name in itself. This is probably the earliest pyramid in Mesoamerica, but we've got one we're going to look at later, which could prove that isn't the case. Um, it's a huge 100,000 cubic metres of earth, uh, slightly conical. Uh, they think it could have been more, uh, it could have been a step pyramid. Uh, some recent research has been carried out um, by uh, the archaeologist Rebecca Gonzalez. It's never been excavated, the pyramid itself, so there could be stuff in there still. But a magnetometer survey in 1967 found an anomaly high on the south side of the pyramid. So there could be something in there, or it could literally be a magnetic anomaly. Um, because this is actually built upon a magnetic hotspot, a zone of magnetism. Also, this is one of the things that John Burke discovered, it's a gravitational hotspot, so there's fluctuations in the grab because of like uh, potentially a meteorite hit in the area. He just shows you some of the, uh, this is a pyramid from the other side, uh, and he's just, they, they, these are all uh, replicas, all of these are unfortunately, um, they've, but they've all been protected and saved in Villa Hermosa. And this just shows you, so this area here is, is the most interesting, there used to be lots of basalt columns, uh, these ones here, oh god, uh, and this is the, the Olmec heads, they have them facing into the um, complex, but actually they were facing out, they were facing north originally, so they've got them the wrong way around. But there's thousands of these basalt columns all over the Olmec world, and these must have been brought up from the river or the sea, because this is the only place this kind of volcanic basalt would form into these shapes, like we see at the uh, Giant's Causeway and uh, uh, even Gunan Padang and, and uh, Nam Madol in, in uh, Micronesia. It just shows you some ones that are on display in the local museum with an amazing um, stele here with brilliant carvings on them. Again, we have the water features. Again, so they were working with the water, potentially not just for to have good water you know, available, but for the energy that this can help produce. This is uh, Leventa Monument One. Uh, it was first described by Franz Blum and Oliver Lafarge back in uh, 1925. These are all on display now, the originals, remember, at Leventa Park in Villa Hermosa. Hey, here's the smiling one, another one. And um, we have this, this is Monument 3 from uh, Leventa. And you can see like the ear spools here, they're quite amazing, and these strange helmets that they wear. Um, this is Matthew Sterling at Monument 4 from Leventa, and this is, again is on display there, and you can see some of the beautiful stonework here. Almost looks like the Sphinx face, doesn't it? It's, it's incredible. And this is an unfinished Olmec head. Uh, and you can just, this is sort of the way they were working with the stone. This is, this is volcanic basalt, remember. This is extremely hard stone. Uh, but it kind of gives a clue as to how they did it, which is a very difficult job in itself. Here's some other discoveries that were made at Leventa just in the last 10 years. Now these are potentially two more Olmec heads, but these have been so badly weathered and damaged, people are unsure if these are even that. This is um, Matthew Sterling, who, um, and he went, when he went to the site in 1940, it was kind of protected by Don Sebastian Torres, who was an 80-year-old na native Indian at, at the area. And, um, and he kind of grew his food on the site and allowed Matthew Sterling and his group to say. And there was a st very strange story. There was an old, a story that the ghost of the Aztec emperor Montezuma would sing and dance in the ruins. What that means, I don't know, but that was one of the stories and legends. Here's one of the amazing altars and they're kind of holding a rope down here and it goes round to the side and joins up with the arm of a woman. Just shows you, uh, you sort of see these uh, serpents here. There's four serpents coming in from different angles. There's also, uh, you get that here as well, you kind of get the weird jaguar head there. 
the crowned figure emerging and holding a rope or a serpent against the ground. The meaning of this is just no one really has a clue. Uh, there's no written evidence of what they're up to. This is a goddess or a female figure. Uh, it's about eight foot high. And then we have these uh, images of these kind of cleft skulls here. Now this is a sign potentially of cranial deformation, which is something that they were most certainly doing in the Olmec world. And this is kind of like a uh, figure with all these flying gentlemen all around him. You can't really see it clearly, holding some kind of mace. Now this is a tradition we find in, in China as well, holding maces as a, a sort of sign of prestige. These are the tombs that were found in the higher levels of uh, Leventa. These weren't really found uh, so much too deep. So these were the, probably the later part of um, the site, probably around 600 to 400 BC. Here's what they look like in, um, at the uh, Leventa Park. And there's the flying figure with a kind of helmet on. This is very strange. No one quite sure what this is. But he's, be he's a bearded figure. We also have this guy who's bearded with a kind of hook nose. Clearly, you know, he looks very uh, different. Doesn't look Olmec, of course. He looks almost like he's from um, the Middle East or somewhere, Phoenician. And also, we have um, this very strange. Um, image here this really gets me this is this is sort of confused a lot of people with it's like this gentleman holding this bag he's got some kind of apparatus or a beard he's surrounded by like a serpent with plumes so this is potentially the first ever depiction of Quetzalcoatl or the plumed serpent and this bag thing has come up over and over again it's something that Graham Hancock's called man bags um, and you find examples at Gebekli Tepe in Sumeria, uh, obviously Levanta. This is, this is actually from Western Africa, this one. So this is interesting because this links with um, potentially where these people may have come from. This is what Ivan van Sertema suggests is certainly the case. We also have this chap. This is uh, monument number 13. This is what they think, they call him, for some reason they call him the ambassador or the traveller because it's like, it's got Phoenician footwear. Uh, headgear is carrying some kind of scythe or flag, and it's got these symbols. No one knows, no one has deciphered what these mean whatsoever. But it's certainly very strange. There's some, some people suggest this is the type of uh, clothing and footwear that Etruscans, Hittite, or Phoenicians would wear around 1200 BC. These are some of the um, serpentine pavements which are in the they have a kind of figure of the face of a weird jaguar he just shows you uh, some of the serpentine there was like over a thousand tons of this uh, at Leventa this is sort of how an artist's depiction of how they were doing it and what they would do they would make these they would fill it up with different types of clay oh, sorry about this they would fill it up with different types of clay and then put another layer on, they fill it over with clay, and then another layer. They would do multiple layers of these and cover them up. So they were like offerings to the sort of earth goddess or something like this, or they had an energetic purpose. Um, now Serpentine and Jay, these, these were the two prized sort of possessions uh, of, of the uh, Olmec. There's, there's, where, they, where some of this jade come from is still unclear. There's, there's potentially some found in Guatemala. There's others found further south past um, El Salvador going into Costa Rica and Panama. There's another source potentially near Mexico City, which is why they think they spread in these directions, as we'll see later. The serpentine is magnetic, and this was the qualities of that were noted by explorer Humboldt in 1794. And this is sort of the layers we're talking about here. It's, it's very strange because these are completely buried. No one, you can't see these from the ground. And this would have been like this during the time of the Olmec. Um, all these different clays, then layers of serpent, are 28 courses of stone blocks in olive and blue clay with these sort of jaguar, weird jaguar faces, the mosaic pavement, there was mirrors placed there, uh, Celt, Celt offerings, jade Celts, clay fillers, like pink clay, it just went on and on and on. This is what it kind of looked like. Th these are the layers of serpentine here, and then we have the layers of jade, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the mosaics here and here. But this is a thousand tons of serpentine <laughs> buried and covered up and forgotten about, so this must have had some use there's no way they would do that for fun uh, and bring that amount of rock such um, so far away. There's other piece of the jade here, uh, really beautifully carved. This has got some strange glyphs on it. These have not been deciphered. 
Then we have these kind of elongated skull figures and these kind of um, cleft skull figures. These are the famous um, sort of, you know, they don't really have a name, but these were like found deep, where we just looked, deep within the ground. This is the several feet below the surface. These were found in situ in this orientation, in this position with these, and these all have elongated skulls. Um, these date to 1200 BC. And they were strangely, when they excavated, they realized someone had dug back down to this uh, a few years later to check they were still there and then covered it back up again, back in Olmec times. So it's very, very strange why they would do that. He just shows you some of the types of skull. So you can see the elongation here. And these are the kind of Celts behind them. But these gentlemen here, they do not look, they kind of look oriental. There's a sort of suggestion by Ivan Van Sertima and other research that they were even Chinese Shang dynasty, um, which I find particularly interesting because these kind of cleft skulls and this kind of elongation was found in the Shang dynasty, which is about, you know, 1000 BC and a bit older. Um, and even anthropologist Betty Meggers noted that the features that distinguish the Olmec are present in earlier Shang Dynasty civilizations in China. So they may have come over and actually influenced or been part of the Olmec culture. There's, she also noted some other different, uh, some other similarities such as the writing style, often carved on jade, the use of batons, we saw that as symbols of rank, the archaeological styles, the mounds, even the pyramids, which we find in China, uh, the feline deities, the weird jaguar, and the cranial deformation, amongst others. And is the, this gentleman is called the Wrestler. He's um, from a site uh, in Veracruz. Again, he has potentially Chinese features with facial hair. Here's the close up. Then we have these very strange kind of babies um, uh, with no kind of parts, if, if you know what I mean. Um, but Shang dynasty admirals and ambassadors were often eunuchs. Now this is another strange coincidence. There's lots of these statues with no parts here. Um, and you can see the elongated skull as well. Another example here. So this is part of the Shang dynasty. This is what they, they kind of did. Um, God, the ancients are weird, aren't they? Why would they do that? Um, and again, we've just got some comparisons here. This is a Shang Dynasty kind of crouching figure with a kind of Mohican. We find almost the exact same thing um, from Leventa and other crouching, they call it the Quizzo position. It's something David Hatcher Childress has focused on. And again, we have the almost Egyptian uh, headdress here. Now this Mohawk and, and the kneeling position has been found in other cultures as well, uh, Colombians, Africans, the Mohawk Indians, obviously, um, of the St. Lawrence River. And in China, this kneeling and Mohawk thing is associated with magicians or sorcerers. So this is another strange connection uh, that we keep finding. Again, we have the, the cleft skull. This is something that comes up over and over again with this very strange gentleman with some kind of um, hat on or helmet. But on the left here, this is, these are Olmec figures, and on the right, these are Shang Dynasty figures with the, potentially what looks like the cleft skulls on both sides. We have this, uh, this is at Leventa. This is like another example of an elongated skull with a huge kind of moustache or beard. And we do get elongated skulls all over Mexico. In the Mayan world, this is, uh, unfortunately, hardly any Olmec um, bones or skulls are still in existence because of the humid climate and they get eaten up. But this, th these are actually from the area of the Olmec, but later, this is why they got saved and survived. This is actually a giant skull with an elongated skull next to it, which I found quite interesting. Um, but the sa it's the same kind of de deformation we find in the Mayan world. We find it in the Shang dynasty. We find it in Peru and Bolivia. We find it all over North America. And the Olmecs, they depicted the different types of cranial deformation they actually do in their artifacts. And so we know what they were up to. And there's proof in later cultures who probably copied them. And these are just some examples from different parts of Mexico. This is actually on display in Jalapa Museum, the big one on the right here. And on the left, this is an example from uh, Ica in Peru. With a strange turtle, I'm not sure why he's there, but never mind. Um, 
And this is a place called Coats of Cocos. Now, I'm, I don't look too happy there because it's windy and cold. Um, but this area here is where Quetzalcoatl, the famous uh, winged god, the winged serpent god, was said to have arrived on a raft of serpents sometime in prehistory. He was a tall gentleman with a beard, robes, long hair, very Jesus style. Most people, most uh, accounts, especially with the Spanish chroniclers, he was depicted as sort of fair haired and fair, you know, with a fair beard and all this kind of stuff. But actually, other accounts from the elders of uh, Mexico suggest he was actually more a darker beard, darker hair, and he was even dark skinned. This is how some of the depictions describe him. So this could relate to the Olmecs. Um, so it just gets a little bit weird when you start getting into this. This is more like Jesus than Quetzalcoatl, but um, uh, whatever. And, um, and uh, there is some, there is some uh, chronicles from different elders. Uh, in the late classic, uh, late pre-classic through to the early classic period, 400 to 600 uh, BC, there's, there's a link with Tiwa to come, which I find really interesting. Um, it kind of arose as a new religious center in the Mexican highlands around the time of Christ. Okay, um, and and there's links with Quetzalcoatl even at this site coming from the Olmec world. Um, this is a depiction from one of the sites. This is almost like a serpent head with wings with a face coming out of it. And, you know, Basil Hendrick in Men Across the Sea book, um, he was always depicted as black bearded according to the ancient traditions. And even with his face was painted black as well, which is, again, very strange. And we can see that this is, um, some of the uh, migrations from the Olmec world, probably looking for jade and just exploring different areas. Okay, what's happened here? Yes. And there's a tradition going way back that this area was called Tamon Chan. It wasn't called Olmec land, it wasn't called Olmen or anything like this, it was called Tamo Chan. So this could be the name uh, of the area of the Olmecs that got remembered and passed down through traditions. Um, and it was Father Sahagun uh, during the Spanish conquest who, who collected this from the elders, uh, and that they arrived on boats in Veracruz, they, and they brought right in books and painting, and founded a place called Tamon Chan, whose elite created the Book of Days, which is probably the 260 day sulking calendar, and the Book of the Year, which is the 365 day harp calendar, and uh, the Book of Dreams, which is probably their magical incantations. Then they abandoned the area and moved to different places. And there is evidence of this because we know they moved to Chatzalcazingo, they moved down to southern Guatemala, Izapa, potentially all the way down to Costa Rica looking for jade. And there's evidence of Olmec type carvings all the way down in these areas. This is a place called El Baul in uh, southern Guatemala. We have the similar headdresses here, a strange bear type figure with strange glyphs. This is Bill Bao uh, with some more relief carvings. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, whip through these fairly fast. This again is Bill Bao. Um, Finca de las Illusions, this is again near Bill Bao. More examples here with a kind of Olmec figure with these kind of sunglasses and mushrooms. It's gonna be just a, you know, holiday snaps now. Um, here we go. This is very interesting. This was found at a site called Monte Alto. These are, again, Olmec type heads with sunglasses on or some kind of, you know. And again, these are the ones with uh, the magnetism that we saw in the temples. And these are some artifacts of, of a chap I met uh, when I was actually at one of the sites in southern Guatemala in 2004. And he had some he collected himself over about a 10 year period. He had 200 artifacts. Uh, more examples here, so sort of Olmec sort of features and styles. And this goes to the site in Gu near Guatemala City, which dates to 2500 BC. So this has caused a bit of controversy, this, especially with the, the heads are made of mushrooms. Um, and again, we have these Olmec features even featured there as well from a very, very early date. And this site called Abash Takalik or Takalik Abash, whichever way you want to pronounce it, again, has potential Olmec heads. And these have been pretty badly damaged and they have kind of megalithic chambers there as well. Uh, and these date to around uh, about 800 BC. And there's a pyramid there, there's this potential, this is another Olmec type head with crouching figures again. 
And even in uh, Belize, we have what looks like uh, a migration going out that way. There's jade pendants that have been found. There's Olmec type stucco. And these are some of the oldest pyramids in Central America. Uh, this is a guy I met called Jim who did some exploration in some caves and came across this sort of Olmec seated figure made of wood, which is one of the rarest pieces uh, there is. Uh, again, at Lamanai in Belize, we have stucco faces that have Olmec features. But it goes on and on. I mean, um, I've got just a few minutes left here, but the migrations go in all directions. It's, it just gets weirder and weirder the more you look into this. But it's this area here, um, Chats Kazingo, Chats Kazingo, which uh, completely fascinates me. We went here uh, earlier this year with Brian Forrester and our group. This is basically an outpost of the Olmec. Slightly later, uh, they probably worked with the local cultures. There's huge uh, kind of mountains here, and they built pyramids um, on the site. Discovered in 1932, and the dating goes back to 1500 BC. So it could be one of the first places the Olmec went. Uh, after they spread out from the Gulf Coast. And on the walls up in the hills next to it, they have clearly Olmec carvings, uh, which are very similar to the uh, Leventa um, uh, carvings we see. This was photographed in 1978 before it got damaged. And this is called El Rey, they call it. And it just shows you, again, a seated figure within some kind of weather system or some kind of machine with all this strange uh, stuff going on around it, so they were controlling the weather somehow. We have these kind of flight, you can't really see it, but there's like a flying figure here, carved up there. I think, oops, a daisy, slow down. And again, we have more relief carvings in the Olmec style. Absolutely fascinating place, Chalcazingo. I do recommend going there if you can. I'm gonna be heading back there in December, just to do a bit more research. Um, it just shows you, this is actually on display in the main museum. This is, this is from Chalcazingo. Um, and this is around 900 BC, uh, and it really peaked uh, this area around 700 to 500 BC. Um, but by, five, by then it kind of went into decline. This is another um, from uh, Burial 3. This is actually from a burial they found there, Monument 17 they call it. And there's other sites in the area, um, Zasakadla, 800 to 500 BC, again with Olmec artifacts being discovered. This is a recent um, uh, photo of some excavations they were doing in this area. Again, this goes from 1200 to 600 BC. And we're kind of talking around right over here, sort of in the area around Mexico City. But one of the most you know, fascinating places in Mexico is uh, Teotihuacan. This has Olmec influences. People don't realize this. Um, the name uh, Tamon Chan actually translates um, better in the Maya than it does in Aztec, and it becomes land of the bird snake or land of the feathered serpent. So it was a name that they were potentially using way back in Olmec times. It also can translate in another dialect to land of the rainy sky, and it's definitely true it is very rainy in this whole area of the Gulf Coast. Um, but what, I think what the, one of the most fascinating things is the fact that, um, that they arrived at Teotihuacan at the end of their era on the Gulf Coast. And this is one of the traditions that was recorded by the Spanish chroniclers. And they founded and built Teotihuacan. This is one of the stories. Another story says a race of giants were created to build Teotihuacan, um, uh, which could be the same people as the Olmec. This is the temple of uh, the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl at Teotihuacan. You can see the, the feathered serpent symbolism here. It's the Temple of the Moon, and even, look, this, this gentleman up here, this jade, uh, jade mask, was actually discovered at Teotihuacan, which has extremely Olmec features. So there could be an influence there. This is me hanging out on the uh, um, Pyramid of the Moon, looking at the Pyramid of the Sun. And even at sites like Quilquilco, um, around, which is near, within the confines of Mexico City, there's some very ancient dating here which goes back to Olmec times or even beyond. And there are figurines that have been found there, which again have Olmec features, which uh, we can, you can see in the uh, museum there. And even Cholula, which is the largest pyramid in the world, which is in a town called Puebla, it's bigger than any other pyramid that 
any, anywhere basically. It's absolutely outrageous. It's, it's ridiculous. They have tunnels in it. It's, it's, it's dedicated to Quetzalcoatl. But they, they have a strange kind of Olmec head here. Look, what is this doing here? Why is that just sitting there, just outside the main steps going up to the pyramid? Um, and the stories go back that, you know, back to the time of Quetzalcoatl, that he was the inspiration for building this, even because it's absolutely amazing. Very strange carved stones here. And, uh, and, and it just goes on and on. You can look at many, many sites in this area and you can keep finding examples throughout Central America of this. It, Monte Alban, this is in near Oaxaca. There's another site called Mitla. This is, again, we see these carvings here and these are famously thought to be Olmec. Now this is about uh, 500 BC, officially this would be the end of the Olmec era. Uh, just some more close-ups of this, so you can just see some examples. I went here back in uh, 2010, absolutely fascinating place, highly recommend it. It's got very high level of astronomy built into the site as well, but it does seem like the Olmecs were based in Oaxaca at the end of their era. Uh, now the, one of the most interesting things, we're going to sort of finish up um, just in a couple of minutes, is the fact that they migrated south into the cent further south into Central America and even South America. And some of the archaeologists and anthropologists believe they could have even gone all the way down to Costa Rica because we have this stone sphere here from San Lorenzo, but there's, there's something like 300 that have been found in Costa Rica around the area of Golfito, Palma Sur, Palma Norte. And I did go down there myself and take a look. And this, this would be, if it, this was the case, this would explain a lot of what was going on because you have the same stories as you head further south of Quetzalcoatl, these uh, plumed serpent gods arriving in various parts of Central and South America. Um, and even, you know, we're looking at the migration routes. This is Africa here to Central America, and this is, this is where the sea, so you can, if you jump on a boat and hit that, you're gonna end up in the Gulf Coast. This is something that's been researched by various people, Thor Heridal and others. And there are traditions, uh, there's a place um, where in Fair Gods and Stone Faces by Constant Irwin, um, she found in some of the skulls she was looking at in Central America, I quote, distinct signs of Negroid ancestry in many New World skulls. Um, but even back in 1956, uh, other African type skulls were found, uh, which are very similar to ones we find in West Africa. And uh, even Friar Diego de Landa, who lived between 1524 and 1579, and he said, but the most important early destroyer and preserver of knowledge of the, the Yucatan, some old men of Yucatan say so they heard from the ancestors that this country was peopled by a certain race who came from the east, who God delivered by opening for them 12 roads through the sea. And this is back in the mid 1500s that this was quoted as saying. And this from, um, uh, I forget where this is from. Uh, where is this from? Uh, this is, sorry, this is Azapa, yes, of course. This is down uh, towards the, uh, the south coast. And this depicts a ship, which some people say is the ship that came over from uh, Africa. Um, and this is a depiction of that. And there's been some serious, you know, archeological and uh, academic research done on this. And now it's kind of opened up to the idea that the Olmecs were indeed from different parts of the world. We have ideas that they were from China with the Shang dynasty, with all the jade and the, 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 the rituals and other such things. We have evidence they came from Africa, probably a little bit earlier. There's evidence now from Europe and the Middle East and some of the carvings and some of the iconography. So it seems like this was a cosmopolitan culture. This is a very strange culture. And although the academics claim they all are local and they all just look like that locally, they look like loads of different people from different parts of the world, it's really a little bit of a joke nowadays because people realize diffusionism is a reality. People could travel across the seas. And, and, and we, you know, we really have to take this seriously. And, and funnily enough, when we, were in, uh, we, we, when we were in Mexico, me and Brian actually thought we met a descendant of the Olmec, not me, uh, this guy. And you can see that the features there are really quite remarkable. And so, you know, there was probably interbreeding between all the different cultures at that time. And, um, and I think, you know, we have to take, take this seriously now. And, uh, you know, and get over there and take a look for ourselves because there's much more to be discovered. I'm going to be going over there in December and hopefully in February to do more research, maybe take a small group out there and, um, 
I think it connects with a lot of the other cultures we're talking about, and I think the dating could also be a bit earlier than what the academics are claiming as more and more gets discovered. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, now you are all Olmec. Thank you. Thank you.